people in the world. Oh, yeah, there you go. But she should be able to hear me from there. Okay. Can you hear me okay, Yoon? I think everyone can hear me okay Yeah, I'm not going to do my stuff. Can you hear me okay? You yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me okay, Yoon? No, but I can hear you. Can you, can you hear me? Wait, I can hear you well, loud and clear. Good. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you. Sorry, technical challenges. Okay, we should be better now. Yes? Oh, good. Yes. Okay, so now we can get started. We have about 80 people online, a little more than 80. And they're still trickling in, and we have you guys, and we're going to record this for the benefit of the Berla family, but also if you guys want to use it at the Jeff. Um, welcome, everybody. For those of you who are online and don't know me, I'm Patricia Zarita, I'm the Chief Executive of Berla International. It's lovely to have so many of you here. <laughs> I'm, I'm used to now speaking to my screen only, um, but it's, it's, the first, it's the first event Berla hosts in CCI since the pandemic. So it is exciting, very exciting. And we're going to talk about something that we're really excited about. Uh, I am delighted to have with us uh, Jung Lee from the East Asian Australasian Flyway uh, Partnership in, um, uh, in online. She's in the UK, but she's online. Uh, and we have also Warren Evans from the Asian Development Bank, and I will properly introduce all these very important people in a minute and Carlos Manuel Rodriguez from the GF. Um, so, the order of the day is I'm going to give you a little bit of a, a, um, a tour of what the East Asian Australasian Flyway Initiative is, uh, why are we doing it, why we have been working so hard on this for the last two years, and what are we hoping to do over the next 30 years. Uh, and then Warren is going to come and speak about why this is important to the Asian Development Bank, why they have uh, engaged with us, um, why they took actually the leadership to push this forward. Uh, then Yoon is going to come and speak a little bit about the East Asian Australasian Flyway Partnership. She's going to talk about the Flyway itself, but also how the partnership works. And then we're going to give the floor to Carlos Manuel um, to talk about the aid replenishment, the relationship of multi-country initiatives with the aid replenishment and why this could be interesting to you guys. Uh, we're going to try to keep this to 40, 45 minutes. Um, and then we'll move on to questions because we want to have this as a conversation. Um, all right. So with that, if everything goes well and everybody can still hear me, for those of you who are online, if you can use the Q&A um, box to let us know where you are, where you're dialing from, it would be lovely to see that. And also use that Q&A for questions that we can um, uh, ask our panelists later, okay? All right, well, let's see if this works. Maybe. <laughs> okay, all right, oh, sorry, no. <laughs> Good luck. Right, okay, so first important thing to remember, this is an initiative that has been designed by Berlef with the Asian Development Bank and the East Asian Natural Asian Flyway Partnership. Uh, we started this process two years ago when I went to Manila and met with the bank. Um, and we had a lovely conversation about flyways and how can we work together. So for those of you who are not familiar with the East Asian Natural Asian Flyway, this is the most threatened flyway of the world. Uh, it is the largest migratory bird corridor on Earth and one of, one of the most densely, po densely populated areas on the planet. I and mean, the flyway is home to 200 million people. Uh, 
but it's also the most threatened flyway in the planet. Out of the eight major flyways that we have, this is the most threatened one, with 61 uh, species of migratory birds uh, either critically endangered or endangered or over or vulnerable. I'm gonna look at this because I cannot see, I cannot turn my neck. The migration is amazing and you will hear it more from Yoon, but the, the East Asian Australasian flyway is particularly interesting because you have these birds that are flying from Alaska and Siberia all the way down to Australia and New Zealand. Some of them uh, go to East, uh, Southeast Asia, uh, but some of them, like this godwit, goes straight down from Alaska all the way down to New Zealand. And we broke the record. Actually, this is the record from last year. But we broke the record again this year when we were tracking one of the birds who flew um, nine days and nine nights, nonstop, 12,000 kilometers. I mean, just imagine that. A bird the size of this. It's a godwit. Uh, so it's magical in terms of capturing the imagination and the, and the wonder that nature is for people. But it's also incredibly important for people. Uh, these are wetlands, most of them, that are providing livelihoods and food security because they are places where we do agriculture and fisheries. They're incredibly important for climate mitigation, especially blue carbon. Um, but they are going to be extraordinarily important for climate adaptation. This is where the communities are going to get worst be hit. Um, and in terms of culture, it's incredibly important to support the traditional ways that local communities and indigenous peoples in Asia have had over the years. Now, why, you're going to hear more from, the, from Warren about this, but why is this important to the bank? Uh, this allows the bank to demonstrate regional cooperation. It goes beyond borders and it goes beyond Asia into the Pacific. Uh, it is within the new uh, ADB strategy, uh, helps the bank build up a stronger relationship with stakeholders, and it helps and empower and engage more um, donors for biodiversity, health ecosystems, local livelihoods, but also for their, and you're gonna hear it from Warren, the extraordinary commitment that the Asian Development Bank just did at Glasgow for climate. So basically we're looking at patching together through the flyway, over 50 wetlands that are throughout, that are located throughout the flyway. Not only coastal wetlands, in some cases we're going to go inland, but mostly it's going to be coastal wetlands. Uh, and we're going to start in China, going through Southeast Asia, but also including Indonesia in this first stage. We will go through the Pacific in the second stages, but for the, for the beginning, we're going to start through um, this area. And for those of you who remember, I think one of the last meetings that we had before the COVID pandemic happened, we were campaigning very heavily with the Chinese government to try to get the Yellow Sea as a World Heritage Site. Uh, in 2019, we managed to get that through. So they throw a lot of the or, um, red areas on that side. Um, are now uh, nominated as areas of World Heritage, um, of World Heritage. Uh, but also last year, despite of the pandemic, we were able to heavily ca campaign with the Korean government to get some of the areas in the Get Bowl in South Korea also as part of that nomination. So this is going to be a multi-site World Heritage site uh, that is partly nominated and is going to continue to be nominated uh, with the support of this project as well. Now, one of the extraordinary things about this is that a lot of these wetlands have been heavily destroyed. But as we keep saying, once you give nature a hand, it comes back. And this is just a demonstration of what has happened with habitat restoration in the United States uh, with the Farm Bill and the Conservation Reserve Program. And wetlands pick up much quicker than any other type of habitat. So by restoring and protecting these sites, we're going to ensure that biodiversity is protected in these areas, but also that they're going to continue to provide the ecosystem services that... Um, I was just thinking, where's the camera? Am I talking to the camera? All right, okay. <laughs> Sorry. I was just I'm talking to you guys because you are here, but there's like 90 people online. Um, so, yes, incredibly important that wetlands bounce back 
very quickly and that they will continue to provide the ecosystem services that people depend on, but also help us adapt to a changing climate. So how is it going to work? The, one, of the, one of the things that makes me so excited about this initiative is that how, clever, how cleverly designed it is. Because we're, we're bringing in, for the first time from the bird life perspective, blended finance for conservation. Okay, blended finance means that we're going to have a big pocket in component one of loans that are going to go to governments to help them support their initiative with the 30 by 30 or um, working on adaptation for climate change. But the, the second component is going to be a granting facility that is going to go to civil society and local communities. And that's going to go hand in hand with the loans, enabling the, and leveraging the funding that is going to the, to, to, uh, to the government. So for the first time, we're using a flyway, we're using nature as the organizing principle to bring in loans and grants to governments, national and local, but also to civil society and local communities. So it's really exciting. It's a combination of formal protected areas, but also OECMs um, that will help us ensure the conservation and the maintenance of the, of the flyway in the long run. Uh, so what are the targets? For now, 50, 50 prioritized sites uh, of about 500, half a million uh, hectares of wetlands throughout Asia that are going to help us protect and secure the flyway in the long run. Uh, improve conservation status of many of these areas uh, so we can make sure that they are servicing for biodiversity and climate, but also for people. Maintaining the network of the flyway. Uh, increasing the number of species um, and hopefully maintaining and bringing back the populations of some of the species that are collapsing, uh, ensuring the World Heritage dominate designation of this site and ensuring that there are these additional benefits delivered to people. So food security, climate resilience, climate mitigation. Um, where are we? So the, we, are, we got a contract, we just signed the contract with the Asian Development Bank for the technical assistance program. Uh, this is about a million dollars that BirdLab is managing. Uh, and that was, we were negotiating with the bank between July and October. We just signed it, as I said. Uh, and that is going to help us deliver an investment plan. So we're writing in the next 18 months, the plan of which wetlands, what are we gonna do in each wetland? What organizations are gonna be part of it? How are we going to engage the governments and the local communities? How are we going to deliver this 20 years of restoration and conservation? So we're aiming, technically that is written uh, in the contract that we're going to deliver in October, 2023. I am pushing for us to have this ready by December next year. Why? Because we need to have the donors engaged. And the more that we stretch it, the less, the less interest that the donors are going to have. While that is happening, we're kicking off already the fundraising for, and the design uh, for the granting mechanism. The granting mechanism is something that we are going to um, mimic from and learn from the Critical Ecosystem Partnership Fund and set it up for being a granting mechanism for flyways. Um, that is something that we are working on already. I am working with the CEPF team and we're already engaging some of the donors to support the design of the mechanism. Um, and hopefully we'll have that ready by December next year. Uh, and then in January, 2023, we'll start the implementation of the restoration and the management of these sites. So the components of the investment plan include of course, the assessment of the sites. We have some information of some of these wetlands, but not all of the information. So we're going to do a lot of analysis of what's happening in terms of biodiversity, not only birds, what's happening in terms of climate resilience and mitigation, what's happening with ecosystem services, what's happening with the livelihoods, and how can we ensure that there's the provision of these co-benefits um, that, that people uh, uh, will have from these sites. We, th through this assessment, we will have a very, um, in-depth consultation with local governments, local communities and organizations that are working in these countries so we can build the investment plan together. This is not intended to be a top-down investment plan that we're coming and saying this is the way forward, but rather building it up with the Berlin partners and many other partners in the region, ensuring that we are tackling the most important problems of the wetlands and engaging the right communities and right governments in the process. 
So while all of that is happening, as I said, I am work with, working on the design of the grant fee mechanism with the CEPF team, but also with the other donors that have worked with me in the past that are providing me a lot of intelligence on how we make this granting mechanism top class. Uh, Warren and I have been trolling the world, <laughs> trying to get additional donors to the initiative. So we have had already conversations with the Germans, uh, the, the French Development Agency, the UK government, um, and we're hoping that we will get the check. <laughs> uh, and that will happen over the next 18 months. And while that is happening, we just landed a half a million dollar grant from the Moore Foundation uh, to assess the investment opportunities in these sites. These sites are going to become important to bilateral donors only if they can provide uh, loans to these sites, right? So if the governments are willing to get loans for these sites, whether it is for green infrastructure or for enabling these communities to adapt to climate change or for them to comply with the 30 by 30 commitment of the CBD. So we are going to use the funding from the Moore Foundation to assess um, the, invest, the investment opportunities of these sites, and then we will be able to have a portfolio ready for bilateral donors to come and start lending while we are mobilizing the funds in the granting facility. Okay? So investment plan will take us about 18 months, uh, but the intention is to have a plan that will guide 20 or 30 years of conservation and restoration in the largest part, uh, flyway of the planet. So, uh, the, the, the overall uh, time frame of this is 30 years, as I said. We will have trenches of five years uh, of investment. We, the first investment period will be for 10 years, but we will do it in five years, five year periods. And as I said at the beginning, the focus of the beginning is going to be China and Southeast Asia, uh, but we will go into other areas as we continue to grow and we will go into some inland wetlands. We're already having conversations, for example, about inland wetlands in Cambodia, uh, as well as potentially Mongolia um, and Bangladesh. Um, so the pipeline is intended to be two to five billion US dollars. So it's massive. We are trying to mobilize that amount of money that will come in form of loans and grants. Um, and the idea is to have investment sites that are receiving between 10 and 50 million per site, uh, depending on what they need. And that's why the investment plan is so important. Uh, but the idea is that the funding will go for conservation of biodiversity and birds, ecosystem services, uh, climate resilience, climate mitigation. Uh, and the sources of funding are intended to be multilateral donors, bilateral donors, private sector, um, private donors, as well as civil, civil society. And then uh, I talked about this, it's going to be a combination of loans and grants. Uh, and the second component that is the, the sustainable financing mechanism as we are calling it, is intended to provide uh, trenches of 15 to $25 million every five years to local civil society and um, local communities. Uh, that's a lot of words. <laughs> <laughs> so, next steps, we are just about to kick off the project since we have, hired, uh, we have signed a contract with the bank. We're going to have this consultative process with local governments, with local communities, with local organizations, as well as some regional and international organizations. So, Paulson Institute is involved, the Wetland, Wetlands International is involved, the International Crane Foundation is involved, and of course, building up on the partnership with the East Asian and Malaysian <coughs> Highway Partnership. Uh, we just uh, we just got the concept approved and launched. We launched it in Kunming uh, at the Convention of Biological Diversity at COP15 in October, and we just relaunched it at, at last week on Tuesday uh, at the at Glasgow. So we want this to be shown as one of those initiatives that is bringing both the climate and the biodiversity agenda very nicely. So. One of the reasons why I love this. We are bringing, as I said, climate, nature, and development together. For the first time, we are aligning lending and granting to ensure that we are leveraging nature and climate uh, using development as an opportunity. It's, uh, it's bringing private and public funding together using nature as, as the organizing principle with loans and grants. This has not been done. This is the first time that we are doing something like this. But Berlin is doing it, but that is actually happening at worldwide. 
in, in a region like Asia, bringing together a, a blended finance mechanism for uh, using nature as the organizing principle. So it's super exciting, not only because it's helping us tackle the, the, the threats and the most important flyway of the planet in terms of threats, but also because we can actually replicate this in all of the other flyways. So Jess, I'm looking at you because this is going to be really big. Um, so that's our purpose. Bring them back. That's a spoonbill sandpiper. You know how small that population has got. We need these wetlands alive so they can survive. And we are absolutely delighted that we have been able to partner with the Asian Development Bank and the East Asian Australasian Flyway to launch this. So that's the initiative. With us, let me introduce, um, we have 99 people online. <laughs> Uh, let me introduce uh, Warren, and, and then Warren will come and um, speak from here. Uh, Warren is, the, is ADD's Special Project Facilitator. He has more than 40 years of work experience in multilateral development, um, being ADD's first director of Environment and Social Safeguards, and later at the World Bank's Environment Director and Senior Advisor. He's also served on the, on the Berlin International Advisory Group, and Warren and I have worked together for many, many years. So, Warren, welcome to Paralyze. Um, why is the bank interested in this? Okay, thanks, Patricia. And uh, apologies in advance. I we had a, a a really, really good run at Glasgow, uh, except that I caught my first cold since COVID started uh, at Glasgow. So I I had a little bit of a throat problem. Uh, so let me let me tackle this from a couple of different angles. First off, uh, the why is ADB interested? We, most of our operations are at the country level, uh, but we focus on regional initiatives, which are not easy. Uh, they're complicated when you have a lot of different governments involved, uh, a lot of different sources of finance. The Flyways Initiative what we call the Regional Flyways Initiative, is a great opportunity for us to, to have a region-wide program uh, that focuses on biodiversity conservation, climate adaptation, mitigation, poverty reduction, uh, you know, livelihoods restoration, just about every, every box that, that we need to tick at ADB to, to justify investing in programs uh, is included in this initiative. And, Excuse me. And the scale is something that is attractive to an institution like ADB. For us, it's very difficult to go in and do one wet lab or uh, even a few wet labs, but I'll, I'll come back to, to that in a minute. So for us to justify the, 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 uh, our costs of transaction costs, we, we need things to be at scale. Biodiversity conservation has been a challenge for us in that regard because, number one, Many governments are not keen to borrow for it. So we've actually, most of what we've done has been with, with uh, Jeff's support uh, and, and with our own grant money. Uh, number two, uh, they are so small that they, for, you know, in many of the sites, the critical sites, they just aren't big enough for us to uh, be able to provide support. This project gives us an opportunity at scale, which is really important for us. Um, third is, is the... Uh, we have just, our president about three weeks ago uh, announced that we, that ADB would increase our commitment for climate finance from 80 billion cumulatively from, from uh, 2019 to 2030, 80 billion US dollars to 100 billion US dollars. That 20 billion dollars, that additional 20 billion dollars was not just grabbed from thin air. Uh, we did a very, very careful review of our portfolio, our pipeline and realized that we were underperforming on adaptation, that, that there was a lot more that we could be doing in support of countries' climate resilience. And a lot of that is focused out on community-based uh, community resilience. Um, so out of that, that additional $20 billion that, that we've committed, uh, the bulk of it will be for adaptation. And, uh, and so this kind of a program is, is ideal for getting climate finance out of scale at a micro level, uh, which we couldn't do on our own. So with partners, 
that uh, like local bird life partners and, and civil society, community-based organizations uh, at the local level, local government will be in a position to actually deliver uh, blended finance at the thank you, at the local level for protecting, uh, rehabilitating these wetlands over long term. So it's kind of an ideal scenario for us. Uh, it's, it, it gives us the opportunity to deliver at the local level uh, on a, on a region-wide basis at scale. Um, let me just talk a minute about the, the blended finance. Uh, so one of the wetlands, well, one of the areas that Patricia was talking about in China that was recently designated a World Heritage Nature Site um, was partially based on a, a loan from ADB to China, uh, a GEF grant uh, of about one and a half million dollars. So it's a, a loan, it's a project of about $60 million. I'm, I'm giving rough numbers here. Uh, with a GEF grant of one and a half million dollars, um, a loan of about 25, 26 million dollars, and, and then China uh, covering the other almost 30, 30 million from their own resources, which is a fairly typical um, uh, formulation of, of, a, of a standalone project for ADB. China didn't borrow that money from us and they didn't use part of their allocation from the GEF uh, just because this is a critical biodiversity area. It's, they did this because they're, they have an economic return on this that's extremely important for China. Uh, it, it stabilizes the community, it builds, it, uh, builds up job opportunities. Ecotourism is booming there now uh, in, a, in a two year period. Um, the, the climate Resilience benefits are already recognized, uh, and and the, the ecosystem services in a much broader area, geographic area, are recognized. So China borrowed uh, twenty five about twenty five million dollars for this. We think that many of the sites are going to be smaller than this, and so it's unlikely we can do a project by project by project level investment. But if we can come together with a number of partners. And this is the last thing I'll mention is why we like this. It's the partnership. So if we if we identify fifty sites through this initial through the initial work here, um, we don't care whether it's ADB money that finances the the conservation and rehabilitation uh, of these areas. We you know the idea is to crowd in as many sources of finance as possible. And so if bilaterals come in with soft money, we can blend that with with uh, grant money from, from sources like the Jeff and, and from our own grant resources, uh, with our loan resources. Um, you can, you know, there are lots of different ways to package uh, the financing of these protecting and rehabilitating these areas. Um, but, but again, delivering at the local level, local driven decisions taken at the local level, what needs to be done, all that needs to be done at the local level. Uh, but by bringing in the partners, at the local, the regional, the international level, we think that we can actually achieve that. I, th I think we can exceed the the uh, uh, the five billion. Or what are we looking at? Two, yeah, three to five. Three to five. So I, I think it'll be more than that. Uh, and and I'm confident that we'll be able to make this work. So ADB is extremely excited about this. This will be, uh, I think, our biggest uh, scale wise biodiversity initiative. Uh, it's very consistent with all of our objectives as a development finance institution and uh, and we look forward to working with bird life and, and uh, the uh, east asia australasia uh, flyway partnership and anybody else who wants to join thank you thank you warren And thanks for braving <laughs> your cold and being able to be with us in glasgow took a toll in a lot of us uh, okay, let me jump to Yoon. Uh, Yoon Lee is, um, yes, you can go back um, and then I'll bring you back so then we can okay. have the conversation. Uh, sorry. Um, uh, where did I put this? Sorry, I just lost your introduction, Yoon. Here it is. Um, Yoon Lee is the External Relations Manage Manager of the East Asian Natural Asian Flyway Partnership Secretariat. She has over 10 years of experience in development organizations at the East Asian Natural Asian Flyway Partnership Secretariat. Yoon is in charge of coordinating the partnership's efforts in resource mobilization and external relations. 
prior to the EAFB, um, she worked with the UNDP Rwanda country office in charge of project management and monitoring and evaluation of the poverty reduction and environment portfolio. And she holds a master's of international relations and public administration from Syracuse University in New York. Yul, it's lovely to have you online. Uh, um, take it away. Can you hear me? We can hear you, yes. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, good afternoon. Uh, it's my great pleasure and honor to join the webinar today. I thank BirdLife International for arranging this meaningful webinar with Asian Development Bank and GEF. The East Asian Australasian Flyway is among the eight migratory water bird flyways in the world. In our flyway, there are 22 countries and the flyway supports 50 million migratory water birds and 36 globally threatened species. It is the highest number of threatened species, mostly shorebirds. The mission of our partnership is to provide a flyway-wide framework to promote dialogue, cooperation, and collaboration between a range of stakeholders, including all levels of government, site managers, multilateral environment agreement, development agencies, private sector academia, and also importantly, civil society organizations and local people to conserve migratory water birds and their habitats, and also the livelihood of the people in the flyway. EFP is recognized as a regional initiative under the Ramsar Convention. There are 39 partners in our partnership. As you can see in the map, we are very pleased to have 18 government partners, six inter intergovernmental organizations, including Ramsar, CMS, and CBD, and international organization, international NGOs, and also private sector. The East Asian Australian Flyer Partnership has adopted a 10 years strategic plan for conservation of migratory water birds and their habitats in 2018. Under the strategic plan, we have five objectives and these objectives are being implemented by our 39 partners. One of the key areas of partnerships work is EFP Flyway Site Network. The Flyway Site Network is a network of internationally important sites for migratory water birds. The network aims for sustainable management of the sites to support the maintenance of the sites and conservation of migratory water birds. Out of 1,000 sites that have been identified as internationally important for migratory water birds based on the criteria of the Ramsar Convention, so far a total of 150 sites from 19 countries have been nominated by government partners and designated as flyway network site. There are three levels of cooperation along the EA flyway. At the flyway level, there is this network of flyway sites. And also the partners meet every two years as uh, in meeting of the partners, we call it MOB. Uh, and we, uh, the partners has uh, uh, worked to implement this strategic plan from 2019 to 2028. Also, we collaborate through working groups and task forces. Also, there is a secretariat hosted by the Republic of Korea government. At the sub-regional level, there are two very important sub-regional level cooperation. First, this first one, this Yellow Sea Coastal Wetland Network. Uh, as you hear, uh, UNESCO World Heritage in Bohai Gulf in China in 2019 and Fort Gepo in Korean title flat in Republic of Korea was inscribed this year in July through IUCN West and Yellow Sea Working Group. Also, we closely work with Asian uh, countries through Asian Flyway Network. At the national level, we work to promote a national and site partnership in each country. Also, we work through sister site arrangement among two countries. EAP works on ground on key species of the flyway through its seven working groups and nine task forces. 
some of the species of concern, such as cranes and black based spoonbill, spoonbills, and piper. I would like to highlight that how, uh, how why regional flight initiative is so important and timely for the EAP uh, uh, perspective. The regional flight initiative brings on enormous opportunities for the flyway. Uh, I also just came back from Glasgow. One of the recurrent messages coming from the COP26 is the strengthening synergies between biodiversity and climate change convention. We've seen that the climate crisis and the erosion of biodiversity are closely interlinked. Global heating puts huge stress on the habitats for migratory waterbirds. Also, many of the wetland habitats used by migratory waterbirds are also carbon sinks. Maintaining important habitats for the migratory waterbirds is also a way to sustainable, valuable carbon storage. Therefore, we really welcome this demonstrated will between um, GEF and GCF uh, mentioned uh, during the COP26 with a long-term vision and collaboration to tackle both issues. The regional flight initiative will be a key initiative to deliver on the ambition of the 18 countries and non-state partners under the EAP strategic plan 2019 to 2028. It will address sustainable delivery of ecosystem services and also embrace the importance of achieving effective economic development outcomes for the communities that share important sites with migratory waterbirds. The EAPP has ad adopted this 10 year strategic plan and there is already government will at the national level through existing EAPP framework in the 22 countries of the flyway. Also, EAPP is inclusive approach. We not only work with the government, but also work with the civil society organizations and local communities. I would like to close my presentation um, to highlight that conservation of migratory water bird is dependent on sound regional cooperation. And EAPP is, an, is a great example of the cooperation at the regional level. Thank you very much. And I look forward to dis discussing with you further on this opportunity. Thank you. That was great. Thank you so much, Yoon. Okay, so now we're going to hear from Carlos Manuel. Carlos Manuel Rodriguez. Oh. <laughs> Carlos Manuel is the chief executive and um, chairperson of the um, Global Environment Facility. Uh, and has held very, various technical and political positions over the last 30 years, including the Costa Rican Environment and Energy being in the Costa Rican Environment and Energy Minister for three times um, and three terms. Uh, as a lawyer by, pro I love this sentence. As a lawyer by profession, politician by choice, and conservationist at heart, Carlos Manuel has participated in all multilateral environmental negotiations as, and is an expert negotiator in the UNFCCC, the CBD, the UNCCD processes. Uh, we are delighted to have you. Thank, uh, thank you. you so much for agreeing to come to Berlin. I, I want to stand up. You can stand up and I can sit over there so I can see you properly. Um, I feel better done. So Carlos, we wanted to know more about your egg replenishment that is keeping you incredibly busy and whether this is something that actually fits that. Sure. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, I'm extremely delighted from the bottom of my heart to be in this building. It's minimal, meaningful, minimal, uh, meaningful to me. Uh, the, this, uh, that bio doesn't say that, uh, that I have seen 5% of the birds of this planet. I'm a birder, and 5% may not mean much to all of you, but for a CEO of the GF, that's a record. <laughs> Probably no other CEO of the GF has, uh, has uh, such a long list of, of birds. I really know what the sandpiper is. I really know what a tanager is. And I, I uh, dedicate a lot of my time to see these uh, beautiful, beautiful creatures. I love them. Um, yes, yeah, I'm so glad that uh, you're being able to see everybody back in the building, uh, Patricia. It was a shock to me go from being on the screen for almost two years in Costa Rica to, 
to see 30,000 people all of a sudden and then uh, come here and see this, uh, this group and, and be able to, to hear you and, and share some of the visions. 30 years of conservation, yes, I, I was there at the beginning of the conventions. And this, uh, this was never written down. It, it is an unwritten agreement. But since I was a very young kid and saw it happening, it is important to me to share what, it ha what happened 30 years ago because here you are thinking 30 years into the future. 30 years ago, two thirds of protected areas were in the north, one third in the south. And we were negotiating the Rio conventions. And one goal was to revert that, uh, that situation. And the commitment was to protect biodiversity where it needs to be protected, which is in the tropics. And in, in, in the tropics, but also in places of high endemism, deserts, cloud forests, you know, different ecosystems. And uh, the agreement was, well, within the convention, the biodiversity convention, we will help developing countries to create systems of protected areas. Believe it or not, there were not systems in protected areas. Probably some countries had protected areas, but they didn't, they didn't have a system of protected agencies or even ministries of apartheid. There were nothing in the early 1990s, nothing. And, and the, the North agreed to provide funding and technical assistance. The GEF came as a mechanism in that context, even though the GEF was already being, you know, uh, already was in, a, had a pilot phase within the World Bank and some UN agencies, uh, it came as an agreement uh, within nations in the context of, of those, uh, of the, those uh, conventions. Oh, today, we were very successful in reverting that, uh, that fact. Two thirds of protected areas are in developing well, and one third in the North. Unfortunately, uh, two thirds out of those the, uh, protected areas in developing countries are paper parks paper parks. I mean, 20, 20 years ago, they were doing great because they were located in remote wilderness areas. Now, they are right next to a road and to a community or to a, right next to an oil palm, palm plantation or soybean or you name it. Two thirds of protected areas in the developing world are paper parks. And based on the economic and human needs, and the fact that the national accounting system doesn't recognize the benefit of them, decision makers are taking decisions to dig a set, shrink them, and many other crazy ideas. So this is what we have. Uh, and, uh, and the Jeff has played an instrumental job in that process. We have been by far the largest supporter, financial supporter, uh, in the creation of protected areas and systems of protected areas. We have created protected areas in every single uh, country of the developing world. If we add all protected areas that the Jeff has participated, it is bigger than Brazil. But still, these are paper parks. Now, I just arrived last night from, from the Glasgow, uh, and uh, I'm really excited about what I saw in Glasgow because, most importantly, the most relevant products out of Glasgow are not the ones who are going to make the headlines in the, on the weekend, because most probably the headlines are not going to be very positive on, on, on the weekend. But what, but what I will tell you is extremely, extremely important. I've been a climate and a CBD negotiator. I was saying the other day, I feel like a double agent because I was there and I was there working there. And, uh, and, uh, Two very different communities, two different crowds, two different conventions. Uh, it took us 15 years to get to the climate convention with an agreement to begin working on forests. That was uh, 2005, where, where we generated breakthrough. And, and back, in, back in those days, you know, forests in the climate convention was seen as, well, we, as a matter of fact, we had a forest day. Uh, during the climate conventions. One day dedicated to forest. The problem was that the forest day uh, happened in a venue which was like half an hour from the main venue. So none of the negotiators were there. 
And all the people who attended the first day were foresters saying how, how uh, talking about how can we harvest and cut trees because this is how we can contribute to climate change. Cutting trees was a great idea to contribute to climate change because the tree grows, offsets uh, carbon, uh, and we cut a tree and we make a, a table and that is carbon that doesn't harm us. But they don't, they don't saw the biodiversity, the human, and even if you do now the real carbon balance, it doesn't make any, any sense to touch any forest, particularly primary forest. Uh, and we created red plots and we have, uh, but still never biodiversity was there. Uh, last week in Glasgow, everybody from the biodiversity community was there. Bird life was there. The CBD was there. Uh, I mean, the, all the NGOs and the bingos and, and I saw a jaguar and a sandpiper and everything there. And I said to myself, my goodness, this is fabulous. Finally, we were able to achieve something that was extremely hard and complicated, which is the fact that the climate community now recognizes that nature should be in the center of climate action because nature provides us cost-effective solutions to whatever we want to do. As a matter of fact, they are totally correct because the energy transportation sector has captured because this, this is where the money is. This is where the economic trade-offs are. The, the energy transportation sector has captured the attention uh, of the climate negotiations for years and years and years for those reasons. But let me tell you, these are the two sectors where we can do the transition uh, faster than any other sector because we got the technology and we got the resources. The, the real problem, the real problem in terms of the climate challenge is land use and food systems. This is where we will hit the wall very soon. And very soon, if we don't prepare ourselves, uh, very soon we will solve, you know, how we produce our electricity and how we mobilize ourselves, but we will be hitting the world uh, without, uh, because of this very complicated issue of land use, land use planning, food systems. So I, I was really delighted as well to hear people talking there and people saying ecosystem-based adaptation, nature-based solutions are the right way. So, so these are, for me, the biggest, most important, um, uh, relevant outcome of the COP. Of course, we're not going to make the headlines. The headlines will be different, but that, this is fabulous. This is super, super fabulous. Then, we look toward the next 30 years. Um, we know that uh, we will if we won't do it if we don't protect nature and we, if we don't restore nature. I mean, it's a matter of, you know, pure common sense. And yes, we got the other convention, CBD. We had the COP next year, and we talk about protecting 30%, high ambition, 30%. Oh, my goodness. That, that, that is, that is zero. for me, 30% is zero ambitious. 30% is the minimum we need to do. What is really ambitious in the context of the CBD is how we all mobilize financial resources from all sources in a way that we avoid what happened in the last 10 years, that we set a set of goals and targets, the IHE targets, beautiful, well-crafted, well-designed targets, but we never agree on how we will mobilize resources. And we thought that the North, the wealthy North, will pay the cost of the whole um, investment on the IHE targets. And that proved not to be uh, the right thing. The, the North has limitations. So understanding the limitation of the industrialized world to provide funding, remember, we agree on this in Rio 1992. Based on the fact that uh, the North has limitations, countries, all countries need to understand that it's in their very own self-interest to protect nature. And developing countries will need to understand that they shouldn't condition uh, biodiversity action for more resources. Because I never seen a developing country conditioning more schools or more hospitals for more ODA. This is extremely important because nature is not there right next to uh, health and education in terms of how you distribute and assign resources 
public expenditures. But we may be getting there very soon. And this is what the Jeff looks at. And I won't go into those details because I need two hour 45 minutes here, Patricia. I will concentrate on, on what uh, you're presenting here because this is fabulous. First, the long-term vision, fabulous, incredible. My congratulations. Second, working with the bank, fabulous, congratulations. Here's where the Jeff can contribute and work with you all, many different ways. One important way, very cheap, extremely efficient, talking within ourselves. We got planning systems, we got dialogue, we got investment programs. When I bring my Jeff team and see the map, we're doing a lot of things over there, yeah. but we don't talk. We don't talk. I mean, the projects in China, the projects in Philippines, the projects in, in Indonesia. I mean, we've been there. Our fingerprints are all over the place, but we don't, we don't talk. And we need to plan because at the end of the day, leverage can give us the, you know, the amplification effect that, that we want. And even though we are a multilateral organism that allocates $500 million a year in biodiversity conservation, and we work with governments, we can mobilize our resources in the same direction that you're doing by really working with those governments and uh, using these, um, these approaches and these projects as a, an important element nowadays that uh, most probably will have a very interesting outcome in the new biodiversity framework. And we, the Jeff, we will have a mandate from the COP. But please understand what the mandate means. All the 200 parties of the convention will send a mandate. Normally, they do it in every single cup. What about having words about flyways, that mandate? Have you ever thought about that? I mean, we need to work with countries and enlighten them on how that mandate should look like. Because it's not just, Jeff, you need to provide us with the money. That's a very, you know rough kind of mandate. We can be creative, we can work with countries, we can work with the implementing agencies, so those mandates can be more specific, more focused, more smart than what we have done it. At the same way that we will be working on implementing JF8. The good news in JF8, we work on four year cycles. We're entering our eighth cycle and our donors have told us biodiversity the most important topic. I mean, this is like music to my ears because I've been hearing climate change is the most important topic for the last decade or more. Second, working with civil society, extremely important. Working with women, indigenous communities, the youth. I will add a, you know, a little piece from my side, those who have an expertise on biodiversity. They improvise, uh, mobilize more resources. The top-down approach is important. These are things that, uh, that um, our donors are telling us. And yes, uh, we, we need to be extremely agile and, and quick to respond to the government's uh, needs. And, and this is complicated, very complicated, because we use taxpayers' money and we've got a government, we had the, the executive branch and the parliament and taxpayers all behind us. We need to be extremely good in accounting with it. And yes, it takes time to do a project with Jeff, but I was saying yesterday, we're not a fast food restaurant. We don't, we don't serve any kind of trashy food. We are like a French restaurant. It takes a little bit more time, <laughs> but our projects are very good. And they move the needle within the project. <coughs> And the, the, the success rate of our projects are high. But uh, remember, we, we don't just work in China or in Brazil or in Costa Rica and Colombia. We work in the most complicated places in planet Earth. And we need to be there. In those countries which are fragile, falling apart, post-conflict, you name it, the, the list is long. The birds, they don't make any difference where they're flying. They don't go, they don't, they don't avoid a country because there was a coup last weekend. And they don't go around. No, no, they go to the same place. We need to be there. We need to be there. So I'm, I'm, I'm extremely happy to be here, to hear this initiative. 
the Jeff has many, many different ways to support it at a small scale, more directly, larger scale, more indirectly, but many ways. And uh, I see that this vision, this concept is totally aligned with what we will see, be seeing uh, out of COP15. So you're ahead of the curve. And I want to congratulate you all for this. The Jeff is going to be here uh, supporting support, helping countries, helping the, the organization to achieve that ultimate goal to um, go from nature negative into nature positive. So my mandate is uh, help countries be uh, nature positive, carbon neutral, pollution free on a, ba on a right base approach. Very important element, right base approach. People, local communities, farmers, indigenous communities are part of the solution. The indigenous communities were the, in Glasgow and they were there not help, not, not asking for help. They were telling us, we can help you solve that problem that uh, you want to solve. I mean, this is great. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. In the question and answer, Warren. Uh, I'm not sure if you're still there, but if you are, it would be lovely to have you. Um, while the questions come from the audience, uh, and, and you guys feel free to raise your hands since you don't have to type anything anymore. <laughs> so, um, so, Warren, for you, uh, oh, great, we have you. Um, very, very quickly, you guys made this extraordinary announcement last week. Uh, do you see this as a great opportunity to demonstrate that climate and nature can go hand in hand? And not only in terms of nature-based solutions, but thinking about the climate investment, you know, that traditionally has not looked at nature. I mean, we saw that in Glasgow this time, but it hasn't been. And I still see a lot of people investing on climate that don't even think about nature. Do you see this as, a, this as an opportunity that is going to guide the ADB, but more importantly, the other MDBs? <coughs> it's always, uh, uh, the answer to the first part is absolutely. Uh, the answer to the second part is, is uh, it's difficult to tell uh, because each MDB is, is different. I would say that IDB is already in this, moving in this direction. Um, the World Bank is certainly uh, has initiatives in a large scale. Um, but I, but I think that for ADB itself, I mean, that's where we need to focus. ADB is currently, <coughs> excuse me, we have a strategy taking us to 2030, uh, our operational plans. And uh, the operational plans give priority. One of the operational plans is for environment uh, and, and uh, climate change. And biodiversity conservation is a very high priority, but the substance beneath that is somewhat weak. So we're actually preparing a, a nature-based development roadmap right, met right now to 2030. This project, the program, the Regional Flyways Initiative is really going to be uh, sort of a, a test case uh, for whether we can go to scale, whether we can get innovative with finance, get in, innovative with institutions, partners, uh, It'll be a test case for that nature-based development roadmap, uh, but it'll also, what we learn from this will we'll drive, uh, you know, it'll change the alignment of the road mm -hmm. going forward. So, so this is extremely critical for ADB uh, looking forward. The, the whole, you know, there is no, you know, you were talking about nature this last week. We were in, a, in an event with Ramsar at the COP, and, and I said in that one, I said, you know, it's about time. Uh, because I've been in lots of Ramsar events on wetland conservation, but never at a climate cop. And, and so it absolutely is about time. And there's nothing more, to me, there's nothing more straightforward than wetland conservation for multiple uh, co-benefits, if you want to call them co-benefits. Uh, and so this is clearly, clearly uh, a program that should be eligible for climate finance as well as other sources of finance. Uh, but at the end of the day, the bulk of the money is going to come from governments. Uh, they're going to invest in these wetlands because they recognize the values, the ecosystem services, the risks of letting, of not rehabilitating them. Uh, and, and it's our job, I think, to, to help them make that happen faster 
as, as you said, uh, and, and for us to do that, uh, you know, we have to be on the ground with the communities, uh, but then still, you know, linking all this, all the, all the wetlands for the flyway initiative. Uh, each of these, each of these wetlands that, that are going to be protected or rehabilitated under this project are worth doing that on their own. If you did an economic rate of return, they would, they would be worth the investment all by themselves. But when you, when you add the, the, uh, the flyway scale and the biodiversity benefits of that, it just, it, you know, that's, that's more than icing on the cake. That just, that takes it over the top in terms of a no brainer. Uh, and so, so yeah, this is going to be really important for ADB going forward. Yeah. And as you said, it, it's really prime for, and we're starting conversations uh, with the Inter-American Development Bank as well to try to replicate this in the Americas. But let's talk a little bit about countries. Carlos Manuel, you said we were expecting the AHI, the AHI targets to be fully covered by internet, by the, the um, developed ODA, developed country ODA. And we've realized that that's not possible and that we need governments at the local level in the developing world to put up the share. How do you see them really realizing the opportunity of bringing all of the multiple okay. conventions together? Because we talked about this in Glasgow and the, 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 the silos that we have been working on. Okay. So um, during the IHE target period, 10 years, we had three rounds of negotiations on resource mobilization. And the first one probably was the one who set the direction. The first one after the um, Nagoya was Hyderabad in India, where the, the agreement was that the North will double the finance for nature conservation and the South will do their best effort to increase it. That was the third. And kind of, we kept that. Uh, in, in, in Hyderabad, uh, we didn't know how much of resources was being mobilized you know, the, we think there's not a global tracking mechanism. Even the convention has a reporting mechanism. Only 30 countries reported, and probably the information is very, very light. So we did, we, we, we had to deal with that. Uh, and the numbers that we did, because I was the chair of the high-level panel for resource mobilization for CBD for quite some period, so I, I was engaged in that. So by 20... 2012, 2013, the, the, the uh, industrialized nations were mobilizing around four to five billion dollars a year. I, I, I did with this team the, the, the financial, the global financial needs, and the global financial needs was between 150 to 444 uh, billion dollars, which was updated by the Waldron report. That was the one that I look at you. Awesome. Oh, the Paulson, there were many good reports uh, last year, so I, I get a little bit confused. Uh, and that one uh, told us that, you know, that the financial needs are uh, around $750 billion. So we agreed to move from 4 to $8 billion, and, and the needs are around $750 billion. But also there's a very important number here. Uh, uh, even though the North is mobilizing around 8 to 8, 8 eight to ten billion dollars uh, uh all nations uh rich and poor are mobilizing around 145 billion dollars today on nature conservation 80 percent of that are public expenditures this is what germany is investing in germany this is what costa rica invests in costa rica 20 percent is gf multilaterals um bilateral cooperation germany through their embassies and uh, private sector. Okay, so if eighty percent is public expenditure, this is where we can really grow, and we can grow in two directions. One is helping out, and if you see the tendency during the IG targets, the grow uh, in public uh, investment in developing countries grow a lot versus ODA. So countries like Namibia, uh, Rwanda. Uh, uh, Botswana, Peru, Colombia, Costa Rica, uh, Mexico, they all increase substantially the resources, even though th there is not a tracking and reporting mechanism, but the tendency was higher in developing countries. And even in some industrialized nations, the, the percentages began declining for whatever reasons, you know, fiscal deficits or whatever. 
we have that information. So we we saw that developing countries can, you know, do much better. So here, two good ideas. One, no country knows because the system doesn't allow them to know how much money they are investing in biodiversity conservation. You go to the Minister of Finance, you look at the eyes of the minister, you ask him, how much are you investing in biodiversity? He can tell you in schools and hospitals and roads. I mean, but no biodiversity. You need to hire an archaeologist to find that out because you need to dig everywhere in the national budget to begin pulling information. If you don't know how much money you are investing in biodiversity, you don't have the minimum capacities to move the envelope. So this is the first thing. You need to know that. When you find out how much money the country is investing in biodiversity conservation, you will have a huge surprise because you're investing two or three times more than what you believe because you only account for the easy, the Ministry of Environment, Protected Areas, the National Park Service. But how about the Ministry of Agriculture? They do a lot of good investment in soil conservation, organic agriculture. I mean, the list is long. And then you find other institutions. All of a sudden, you got three times more money than what you believe. And you got a biodiversity plan with just one agency working on it. So if you bring the other who are investing around the biodiversity plan, your impact would be higher. Your needs would be lower. That's the, the basic, very basic action that you need to do at the country level. And the second one, all countries invest more in economic activities that destroy nature than what they invest in protecting nature. I mean, this is, we invest many, many, many more times in economic activities that destroy the planet than what we invest in nature conservation. As an average, humans invest 142 times more financial resources in activities that generate deforestation than what we invest in forest conservation. This is the most <laughs> crucial element. It's not mobilizing more resources from the north. It's not mobile, putting more taxes at the country level. It's being more policy coherent. So if you need to align your public and private investment with the Paris Agreement, with the new biodiversity framework, this is easy to say, very complicated to do it. But at the end of the day, we got, you know, we're looking 30 years, okay, we've got this first decade, let's begin moving the information, the data, the systems into something that eventually we will have a full alignment to this sustainability framework and we will avoid social socializing the environmental cost because at the end of the day the environmental the, the invoice will be paid by the poor or by those who are the you know the young people who are you know next generation so those are the things that's kind of our vision in jeff in jeff a we'll begin putting pieces in jeff a so in jeff time we can really begin moving that as you consolidate your uh, migration your flyway <laughs> so let me let me feed in one of the questions from from the audience online here they say how do we as civil society organizations encourage our governments to support the inclusion of the flagging concepts in their cbd cop mandate look at me yes <laughs> well uh, different ways uh, you know we we need to put the set the science and the data cbd is good in that and uh, we need to to read it you know, what I would be doing if I were a civil society or a conservation organization in a country, I will first, you know, I will find out who are the negotiators, okay? Names, where they are, in what institutions. And I will begin engaging with each of them. I will do a very basic political approach. And I will be, uh, because every government has negotiators for different streets. Uh, so there are many streams in CBD, there are probably 30 different streams being negotiated. I need to find a guy who can do that. And I began engaging with him, providing information and doing, you know, the, the basic campaigns that I, that I need to do. I will, I would like to be an advisor to them and be part of the delegation at governments, many governments. I remember Brazil bringing 700 people to the COP. It's not 700 people from the government. It was probably 200 people from the government and the rest from private sector and other sectors who who were, you know, in, in symphony with the government and they were helping because they create these, these processes. The scientific community needs to have 
a, a, a political angle in how they manage the, they need to make their data and approaches policy relevant. So engage with the negotiators. The negotiators will love because they are not ecologists and biologists. Probably yes, but they don't have much of a field spirit. They will feel good having an expert right next to them talking about flyways, talking about wetlands, talking about this and the other. I have seen it many times. As a matter of fact, in my days in CI, this is what I did. Connecting negotiators with their state, with the, their national, their experts, economics, biodiversity, and others. And I did, you know, workshops, facilitate that engagement. So I, I think that there are ways to design systematic approaches that can help them. Uh, the civil society to do that. And of course, civil society more and more have, has in the space in, in, in negotiation. And I'm a strong believer in multilateralism, but also, I'm, uh, yes, where, you know, we all collaborate, but also I'm a strong believer that we need to generate more spaces to non-state actors. Mm. Because non-state actors are ex-spectators in the bleachers, looking at those others, taking decisions. And uh, that hasn't worked very well. Mm -hmm. how, do, how do we change? This is a change of paradigm. This is, you know, in the core of the UN system. Well, I think that there may be ways. Indigenous communities. Indigenous communities are the owners of 800 million hectares of primary tropical forests. Without them, we'll never achieve any sustainability, large-scale, large, scale, large, uh, large uh, long-term goals. And they are not in the decision-making processes. Uh, and um, and we need to do that. So uh, I believe that non-state actors should increase their role and participation in all of this so uh, people can contribute into that. Of course, you've got a lot of challenges in terms of governance and political structures. There are many countries that doesn't believe in civil society and doesn't respect human rights and, and civil rights. And that is an issue that we need to confront. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Okay, let me move on. There's a question from, I, I have to say, you guys have to know this. We have people from Argentina all the way to Malaysia and Singapore, and they have been posting questions. So um, this is the power of the Berlin family. Um, <laughs> Uh, a question from one of our partners from the Malaysian Nature Society, and you, I would like you to talk about this, if you can, also speaking about the challenges that you see um, from uh, the East Asian Natural Asian Flyway Partnership Secretariat perspective and, you know, all of the experience that you guys have had uh, over the years trying to keep the flyway alive with all of the partners. The question says, uh, every year in January, we have the Asian Waterbird Census. How far the data of that those activities are shared and analyzed in terms of species and habitat quality? The data probably can be used for future conservation of migratory water birds in the East Asian Natural Asian Flyway. And it goes back to your data, your point about data, not only in terms of biodiversity but also about finance. Yun, do you can you yes. comment about this? Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Loud yes. Yeah. Thank you. So. Uh, uh, maybe I can say that at the last MAP 10 in China, the, we adopted, the, the partners adopted the decision of the development, development of a conservation status review of migratory water bird population for the EFP in 2018. Um, and to proceed with this development of conservation status review, the uh, EFP Secretariat has contracted Wetland International to coordinate the preparation of the first CSR in 2021 and 2022, and this will be uh, implemented through the close consultation with our technical subcommittee and science unit, and our and also the Secretariat and our working group and task force and other experts. And uh, we can the Secretariat will be happy to provide more information if the the if the person directs the question to the secretariat, and uh, yes, that uh, we will be happy to proceed more information. Yep. Great, thank you so much. And, and what do you see, just before I move on to Warren um, and Carlos Manuel again, what do you see are the biggest challenges for implementing our initiative? You guys who have had so much experience with the East Asian National Asian Partners. 
Um, well, yes, um, there are some challenges in our flyway. Um, of course, there is a gap of the capacity building and our um, focal persons sometimes are not the same focal person who are in charge of the climate change project. So they also address the challenges of talking to the Minister of Finance to convince the Minister of Finance to develop a project for the a large scale of uh, project for the biodiversity and the flyway projects. So there is some challenges inside the government to uh, talk between the ministries and between the environment ministry and the government. And that is one of the challenges we want to tackle. And also, I hope that this regional fly initiative can provide a um, uh, funding and support to our partners to be able to develop a very uh, good and bankable project. So uh, like readiness project from the GCF, I think that's something our partners are uh, looking forward to uh, receiving from the regional fly initiative. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Yoon. Uh, readiness projects <laughs> and the granting mechanisms. One of the problems that we have is that, or not problems, but challenges, is that the multilateral development banks and the regional banks have very hefty, beautiful portfolio for loans and not so much for grants. Um, do you think that that's going to change over the years? And, and how do we use these opportunities like the Flyway Initiative to start making it more viable for uh, donors and, con and, and development banks to be granting money? Well, each of the, the multilateral development banks is, is a little bit different. ADB is one that actually has had uh, our own grant facility since its inception uh, based on a certain percentage of net income plus contributions from other donors, uh, from, from some of our owners uh, that, that are uh, grant funds that are dedicated for, the, for the, uh, the poorest countries. So we actually do a lot of granting, but the bulk of that is to invest in preparing a feasibility study for investment programs. So it's, it's how, do you, how do you actually prepare a project uh, ready to, to uh, justify an investment uh, alone for that. Uh, I don't see a big increase in the internally mobilized grant resources. Uh, if anything, it's going to be tighter uh, in the future. Uh, but I do see a different, uh, a different model. I, you know, the, the, uh, the availability of uh, philanthropic money is critical now. Uh, and I think we're finally learning how to, to capture some of that. Uh, if we can, if we can actually uh, reach the holy grail, which is institutional money, uh, pension funds, and, and uh, similar funds that are very large scale that are looking for long term, large scale investments, it'll make that uh, that'll give us a lot more headroom to to actually use more grant resources for initiatives like capacity building to support this kind of a program. So I think it's it's going to change over time. Uh, uh, as Carlos Manuel said, I mean, if you take all our grant money and, and add it up from the from from everybody, it's it's just a drop in the in the ocean. Yeah. But it has such a huge leveraging impact. Yeah. Uh, and so I, it's I think it's less about how much is available. It's more about how we use it. We've got to use it smarter, more directed, more more you know, cost effective. Um, and, and local, you know, experience shows that investing in local community capacity is, is a, an excellent investment. The only, the, the highest, highest return on investment, uh, of any is investing in girls education. That gives the highest return of, of, it, of all. But I think that investing in communities, uh, capacity to, to, uh, for them to drive the development process is probably very, very high on the uh, uh, on the list of, of good investments as well. So I but I don't I don't see a big change in a hurry on on grant resource availability. I think it's going to be there's going to be a change in the in the uh, the model and the formula in the future. And uh, we need to really understand that um, now on 
uh, financial resources uh, for climate adaptation will be kind of a big topic. As a matter of fact, yesterday in Glasgow, we, we received pledges for $410 million for climate adaptation in less developed nations. And we will be supporting less developed nations. And this is twice to what we uh, 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 fundraised last time that we were replenishing this fund. Mm -hmm. And we will be supporting countries in implementing their national adaptation plans. But if you see the national adaptation plan, uh, nature plays a very low role there. You, you don't see the wetlands. And, and let me tell you, probably wetlands is the second most important investment after the John Davis. <laughs> <laughs> well, pro most probably, but it's not there. Yeah. So we fundraise for climate adaptation, and when we go to the country level and see their national uh, adaptation plans, uh, the role of wetlands, the role of nature, the role of restoration is not there. We concentrate a lot on best practices in the agricultural sector, but we look at the farm. We don't look down, uh, downward or upwards of the farm. Yeah. You got the wetlands down, you got the watersheds up, you got and what connects everything? Water. Yeah. And water is a big, big issue in terms of climate adaptation. So these are the things that um, bird life and this partnership needs to begin putting in a lot of attention because this is where the funding is going to go. And yes, um, becoming become, becoming more resilient is important. Uh, wetlands give their resilient benefits and give us the biodiversity benefits as well. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about the way that the Jeff works, Carlos Manuel. And, and you have heard me chanting this multiple times, uh, star allocation. <laughs> so for those of you who are not familiar with the Jeff, the Jeff functions with star allocations for each of the countries. They have this lot of money that they can use for the Jeff priorities. And for those of us who want to implement regional projects, we have had to go through multiple negotiations with each of the countries on the start allocations um, to try to patch it together, which is interesting, huge transaction cost, and sometimes it takes forever. Um, so do you think that it, looking at initiatives of the scale of the regional flyway initiative, would it be possible to think about something that it goes in parallel, not undermining by any stretch of imagination the start allocations, but can it go in parallel complementing? Okay. So let's, Let's think on, on the system that we have today because the system that we have today can work directly as we think on a parallel system. Uh, and, and this is a great opportunity to explain. The Jeff is the uh, financial mechanism for the conventions. It's an agreement within developed and developing countries. They got a board uh, where the developed countries who provide the funding has majority and they take decisions. The decisions are taken by donors in the replenishment. Of course, uh, 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 everything is done under consensus. Sometimes it's difficult for consensus, but I will say it is a mature organization. Yeah. 30 years, not the business, and it is not politicized, which is extremely important. So for many years, we've been working on each one, each one of the conventions. So we do projects for the countries on the Biodiversity Convention, the Climate Convention, the Land Degradation Convention. Then we created other windows, uh, windows that work with international waters, windows that work on wildlife, windows that work with indigenous communities, because in every cycle, donors and recipients agree to move the, the you know, to move the needle a little bit more than just the main convention in just countries. Yeah. We got a small grant program for 30 years that allocates, you know, small grant to civil society, very successful, with very high transactional costs. So uh, eight years ago, um, Jeff understood that uh, that the, the size of the problem and the size of our mandate is extremely big. And we are just trying to solve the problem, not addressing the root case of the problem. Mm -hmm. Here's where we began to explore new ways by uh, to engage with countries through the impact program. So we designed three impact programs we're, and we look for more flexibility because I do an investment, I do a project for the Biodiversity Convention, and there are direct climate benefits. 
So we, we create impact programs that are looking for more the integrated approaches as we look for more flexibility now in JPE, we are proposing full flexibilities for the countries. So the countries can design a large project that addresses all the different conventions. As a matter of fact, when I was a minister in Costa Rica, instead of doing five jet projects per site, well, I did just one, just one project. And I was not the door of the World Bank because the World Bank, if I convinced my minister of finance, they gave me 30 to $50 million to those 10 million grants that they get. And all of a sudden I had a $50 million for a project that um, that gives me biodiversity, climate and land uh, benefits. We're moving in, into that uh, direction, which is extremely important and will have a, a stronger impact. The STAR is the, is the mechanism by which we distribute the resources because uh, uh, Nicaragua and China are very different. And our mandate is to generate global environment benefits. Okay? And we are not a development fund. Uh, China income per capita may be growing. That doesn't mean that we need to graduate or the economy of China has grown. We don't need necessarily to graduate China out of that. Mm. But I will graduate China when the emissions go down and nature go up, mm. I will, or whatever nation. Unfortunately, not a few nations are in that track, others most in, in the different direction. So uh, we want to create now more integration, more flexibility, but also direct access to, uh, to others because, and, and this is kind of a new approach, I, I have a lot of political challenges with recipient countries. When I say that the jet money is for the countries, not for the governments, mm -hmm. okay? It's being used by the governments. Mm -hmm. And if you are civil society, you are a whatever, you need to go to the minister for an endorsement letter. I mean, that, I'm a politician. That is called political control. Yes. Uh, you got the political control. <laughs> you got the political control. If you are a friend of the government, you are okay. If you are not a friend. <laughs> yes. So I need to walk the talk in creating a mechanism that really gives money to the country, and yes, of course, it's very important to assist the government, but the, but the, but the country is more than the government. We're moving into that with a lot of uh, pushback by, by countries, uh, but I will be pushing for that. Donors are extremely excited to hear that. So I want to generate direct access. Today, the major of, we got a program of sustainable cities. Very interesting, put a lot of money. It's the largest in the plant that works on sustainable cities. I got a major who wants to access my, uh, the jet resources, needs to go to the minister for endorsement letter. And, uh, you know, all majors want to be ministers and then presidents. That is how it works. <laughs> I don't know how it works. So you got issues there. I want to create direct accesses to majors, to civil society, to private sector. Uh, of the jet resources, and that is what we are done working and thinking. So, and the other good news is that most probably uh, we will have a larger uh, replenishment than the last May. And that is thanks to you all that has been working so hard to put in the science, the data, the ideas that has, you know, convinced our donors to be where we are, where we are in a recession, in a global recession fiscal space super limited uh, i don't know why we continue calling them rich nation or developed nations because if a developed nation has this amount of emissions that that's a wrong perception or even rich nations because they are all in debt with big debt and big debts mm -hmm. the good news is that climate and biodiversity which were in the top 10 priorities for oda went from nine and ten probably to third and four so they went up in the priorities of donors, even though the fiscal space is smaller. So we got a great opportunity to do much better than before. And I expect that that can be translated in, in a robust replenishment for, for the Jeff Hub. Probably 20, 25% uh, will be great news. And most of that will be focused on biodiversity because of the direct benefit that biodiversity gives to climate, land degradation, human well-being, and your Great. Okay, we're coming to our uh, to the end, but I do want to tackle two questions. I don't know if there are questions here. Sorry, I have completely neglected you in front of me. 
Um, okay, so two, two quick questions. Um, and, and this goes to the two of you, uh, and you will talk about the, the second one in a minute. So this comes from David Griffith, a supporter of her life. He says, I'm a health project planner and using the 1993 World Bank report on investing in health, I have spent and still spent a lot of time persuading finance ministries that spending money on health is not a cost, but an investment with a good rate of return, not as good as investing in girls' education. I hear all the panel members saying investment, but do governments and others see putting money into the flyways as an investment or just as another cost? Well, I, th I think it's uh, I think it's too early to to answer that across the region, but we certainly have um, several countries that are in the flyway, uh, not just China. Uh, for example, Bangladesh is borrowing a lot of money for coastal rehabilitation. Uh, they, they recognize the, the economic rate of return. Um, they do this without having very good valuation of what the actual payback is. Uh, I think we have better data, better valuation of ecosystem services. Um, it would be easier to convince uh, the, the finance ministers. By the way, that reminds me, the very first time that we met, if, if you were still minister, and you were explaining that the only way you could get money was to learn to speak the finance minister's language, not the environment minister's language. And I think that's part of the key. We've got to have the right data. We've got to have the right message. Uh, but I think countries are, are certainly uh, investing. I mean, when we, when uh, I, I led the development of the climate investment funds, and there was a huge battle at the time over the, the, the use of loans for adaptation. It was just seen as evil. But the reality is that governments are borrowing for climate resilient development all the time in many sectors. Uh, it's how we it's how we put together the the financial pack the financing package, uh, how we understand the economic and financial rates of return, and it's very similar to the health sector. Uh, so I think governments are uh, already borrowing for this, but not at the scale that's needed. And there's not enough, that what, what isn't happening, I think, is, is not near enough investment in building the capacity at the local level to be able to sustain the investments. And, and that we, that's, that's something that a, an initiative like the Regional Flyway Initiative can give equal focus on local communities, local civil society, as uh, you know, the national and, and regional uh, uh, objectives in, in investing. So, so I think, but governments are borrowing for this already. And, and ministers of finance are they are you know the top economists in their countries and they understand it very well. They know that investing in nature is you know putting money in nature is not a cost; it's an investment. But they got to borrow money money to pay the the payroll of the government on the monthly basis. Uh, the 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 situation of debt in the countries are incredibly complicated uh, because of the COVID the pandemic. So the, the debt issue is huge. So governments have to go and borrow money to pay ordinary costs at the country level. So here, you know, talking on, on wetlands doesn't resonate because Minister of Finance are 24-7 trying to find money to pay the salary of police, salary of uh, uh, teachers, and every, everything else. And they are in. At the same time, they are cutting expenses. You know where they are cutting? In the conservation agencies, in the Ministry of Culture, and, and those things Science. that doesn't get. Yeah. So this is this is a situation they got now. We, we need to, we need, and they are willing, they, and they say, well, probably the, if I do things correctly, the next Minister of Finance will do that. What you're asking, I need to clean, have healthy finances. Uh, and then the, the next minister will do those investments. That, that is what I hear from them. So the situation is, is desperate. Nevertheless, they connect the dots very well because when the big flood comes and the president picks the phone 3 a.m. in the morning, who is calling? The minister of finance. And, and, the, and the president wakes the minister of finance 3 a.m. And, and tells them, I need the money 8 a.m. in the morning. And the Minister of Finance calls the head of the emergency agency and the head of this and the head of budget and 
And he connects the dots, you know, the flood with money. He connects everything. So things are kind of there. We're getting there. But uh, at this point, the economic recession is a, is a big burden uh, for, for many countries. And, and I think, I, I in, and in response to David, I think that the, the element of the climate resilience is a massive element of investment. I mean, we are truly investing in making these communities more adaptable to climate change. And unless we actually put that money on the table on, on nature-based solutions and green infrastructure that is going to help this, com this community survive, you know, sea level rise is happening. Changes in temperature are happening. The floods that you were talking about are happening. We need to make sure that we are investing in this. So we need to keep uh, Cambridge uh Rainy, green, and gray. Yeah, there you, go. <laughs> you know, you know the, there is an opportunity to to use the investments in recovering from the pandemic, mm -hmm. uh, in bringing economies back. There is an opportunity uh, to green that, uh, to to actually, you know, shift the focus onto uh, new jobs and in in, in uh, conservation and you know, renewable energy. I, you know, I, this is going to be a really, really tough challenge, but uh, to convince governments when, when things are so tough mm -hmm. right now to, to actually shift the direction of investments. But, but I think there is a, you know, there is momentum in some, in some countries to, to do that. And certainly ADB, we're giving this a very high priority in terms of the support at this stage to countries to really refocus the, the medium term strategy not not near term near term you've got to get over the the hump you got to pay the salaries yeah. right uh but in the in the medium term there's an opportunity to help uh collectively to kind of transition to a much greener pathway okay last last question because i know that we're running super over time the jeff is one of the kda partners and we are looking at protecting the most important wetlands. So the question is, how important will it be to identify key biodiversity areas along the flyway in order to focus on the most important sites? And you, it'll be good to hear your thoughts as well on this. So um, I, when I look to the 30%, I, I mean, it is KBAs, indigenous communities, we get the 30%. OECMs, yes, heavily on that, but KBAs, and indigenous community, we got 30%. It's kind of relatively easy. Now, when you go country by country, you, you deal with problems. And it, uh, I had a conversation yesterday with the Minister of Environment of Uruguay. Uruguay. Uh, there is no possibility that you need to get rid of hundreds and thousands of, of cows and uh, in order to, to do the 30%. Of that will never work in the biodiversity benefits may be extremely low, as opposed to many other countries. So we need to keep uh, on, uh, keep helping countries on that. The GF will um, will do a quick uh, fast track investment in early action, uh, even before COP fifteen, on countries who are willing to really you know uh, tune up the mechanism to define what that what the thirty percent means. That will give them some level of confidence uh, as they approach that COP fifteen. You, any wisdom, thoughts about key biodiversity areas and the wetlands? You're muted, just in case. You're mute. You're mute. I'm sorry, <laughs> can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, the simply, my answer would be that it's actually a good opportunity for the partnership to rethink if flyway network sites can be aligned with KBAs. It's not something we can. We have um, uh, uh, certainly have alignment at the moment. So I think we should discuss with our partners maybe at the next mob in next year how we can align uh, flyway network with KBAs. Yeah, I will stop here. Thank you. Last opportunity. Questions from here? Okay, if not, I'm gonna close there. We, I'm, I cannot do that without thanking you guys for being here, for sharing your wisdom, for supporting a huge thanks to the Asian Development Bank and to the East Asian Natural Asian Flyway Partnership for leading and co-leading with us this extraordinary initiative. We are over the moon, over the moon, that we, this is actually happening. It is a dream that we have been working on for some years already. 
And we really hope that we're going to be building on your fantastic footprint and all of your fingerprints on the region, but building up new things so we can actually do it together for the next 20 years. Sure Thanks so much for being here. Bye, Yun. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Okay. Okay. Bye.